sing praise to the one who is worthy. As we sing praise to the one we adore. This morning, we're going to talk about the actual birth or the true birthday of Messiah. It is not December 25th. Nobody thought it was December 25th, right? Okay, good. It's not. Uh, let's open up first with, with the scripture that we're at, we, we started off with. Uh, verse 25. I want you to realize that in the book of Daniel, what we're reading here is, is not about, an, it's about Antichrist, but it's not about an individual. The idea of Antichrist is not a, it's not a man who's going to come to power and rule over the earth for any amount of, uh, of time or a certain period of years. The spirit of Antichrist, the principality or the power behind Antichrist is what is being spoken of here. That is what Antichrist really is. And even when you read about it in the book of John, it never speaks of Antichrist as a man, but always speaks of it as a spirit. And so what we're talking about, or what Daniel is talking about here, is that spirit of Antichrist that has been around for a long time and, and is still around, and what he will do in particular here to the Jewish people. And it opens up with verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Remember, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. That's the real enemy. It's not a man. It's not a government. It's not a leader. It is that the power behind all of those things. Do men do evil things because of the spirit of Antichrist? Yes, absolutely. But it is the principality behind it, or what we would say, I guess if we were to put it in a nutshell, we're talking about Satan and those principalities under him. Because as you read on in this, it says that this, this spirit, this, this prince, if you would, speaks pompous words against the Most High, curses God, speaks against the things of God. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High. From this perspective, they're talking about the Jewish saints, but all of the saints, Jew and Gentile, will be persecuted by this spirit. And shall intend to change times and law. Let's get back to that in a second. But as you read through this, it says that the saints will be given into his hands, will, will be uh, attacked by him for this period of time, times, and half a time. Believe it or not, it means 2,500 years, but that's another message for another day. But for a long time, the people of God have been dealing with this spirit we know of as the Antichrist spirit. It says, however, there's going to come a time, this isn't going to last. The dominion of Antichrist is not going to last. Who's in charge of the world today? Satan. Satan is. He is the god of this age, this world. That's who we're talking about here. It's not going to last. His dominion does not last. But it says, the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. Who's the they? The Lord God is going to take away his dominion. We're talking about the return of Christ. That's what's being spoken about here. The courts will be seated. Judgment will be done. Uh, Antichrist will be removed. His dominion over this entire planet will be taken away. To consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven shall be given to the people and the saints of the Most High. The people who have served the Lord God Amen. in resurrection will be given dominion of what? This place this place. We will reign and rule in this place. And then it goes on to say that his kingdom, who's the his? God, Messiah. God, yes, the Father, but Messiah. It's Christ who returns. His kingdom, it says, shall be an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions, meaning all the nations that are still on this earth, will obey him. That's, that's the whole picture of what you see there. But what I want to concentrate on, because we are still, we haven't gotten to the end part of this paragraph. We're, we're, not, we're going to get there sooner or later, but we're not there yet. We're still in the part of dealing with the God of this age. We're still in the part of dealing with the principalities and powers. And I know that we don't often think about it this way, though we should. We're in a battle. 
we are, we are in a conflict. There is an organized, determined effort to try to thwart you, cover your eyes, cover your ears, bring excuse, water down, move away, compromise the things of God to those who believe and to the unbeliever, not to even let them get that far. There is an effort that's, now I know, again, we don't think about this because we don't visually see it with our eyes. Actually, we do, but I, don't, I think we don't recognize it with our eyes because we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so there is a battle that has affected every single person on this planet. All of us, you and I included, have been affected and are still affected by this battle. And there are some times when we're being affected, we don't even realize that we're being affected by this. But one of the things I want to talk about for this morning, after it says that he has pompous words against the Most High, it says that he shall intend to change times and laws. This may seem small as you're reading it because the big thing here is the coming of Messiah and how he has victory, but this is important because it gives us a window into the schemes of the enemy of your soul. One of the things that he knows he must do is change times and laws. What does that mean, to change times and laws? There's, there's obviously something about times and laws he doesn't want you and I to what? To know. He wants you to be blind to something. He doesn't want you to understand something about times and laws. So there must be something very, very important about times and laws. What it's actually speaking about, and we've talked about this before. Would you reset this for me, dear? Thank you. The times and laws that we're talking about, we've talked about this for weeks now. We are talking about the moed, the times and seasons that God has appointed. We're talking about the feast of the Lord. We're talking about God's calendar. The seven feasts of the Lord are the times of God. In other words, when it says he wants to change times and laws, he wants to change it from God's calendar to any other calendar. So long as you don't understand what? God's calendar. So long as you don't understand the times and laws, fine. He's done his job. And believe me, he has done his job well. He has affected and infected the entire planet with a different set of calendar than God's calendar. The times and laws, and again, we've gone over this. The, the top, moed means seasons or times. Even more than that, it means appointments. There are appointments that God has set. How many of you use an appointment calendar during the week or use your cell phones? What happens if, if, if you gave me your, your little uh, iPad or iPod or, or, or smartphone or whatever it was, and I traded your calendar for my calendar, and, and you had some really important things to do this week, and you opened up your, your phone and you flipped it open and you did your little doo -doo 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 thing and you were at the wrong place at the wrong time. What would you miss? Everything. Everything. All of your set appointments would be missed. Why? Because you're using the wrong calendar. Use any other calendar but the one that affects you and you miss your appointments. Plain and simple, right? Well, if God has set up appointments or moed, if he has set up seasons and appointments, feasts, that he calls holy convocations or dress rehearsals or, or, or uh, set appointments, if we don't know when the set appointments are, what happens? We miss them. Not only do we miss them, we have no idea that they're even there. If we're working on a totally different calendar, how could you even know that there is a set appointment? How could you even understand that you've got to be someplace at a certain time? That you've got to do something on a certain day? That you've got to, that you've got to uh, be part of a dress rehearsal for something that's coming? 
to be prepared for something down the road. We wouldn't know. And that is exactly what Satan has done, not just to the world, to the church, to the people that call themselves the church. He has changed the times and the seasons, and by changing the law, it means Torah. It's changed God's word. Whether it's watered down, or it's milked over, or it's moved aside, or it's forgotten, he doesn't care. So long as it's not the way it's supposed to be. Anything but that. And I want you to see that here in Daniel, which has nothing to do with birthday or anything else, it clearly tells us what his intentions are for battle. I'm going to give you the wrong day calendar. Follow my day calendar all you want. Call any day anything you want. It's the wrong calendar. And if it's the wrong calendar, it doesn't matter. And that's what Satan's done, and that's what this particular chapter is about. The Moed, the feasts, and I know we've talked about this, there they are up on the screen. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. We talked about those four already. Those are the first four feasts. We're past Pentecost now. Pentecost was just a few weeks ago. We're past that. Those four appointments are past for us. Bless you. There are three appointments still yet to come, or three Moeds still to come. Trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. For this morning, I want to skip to the last one, tabernacles. And I'm going to skip over trumpets and atonement. We're going to talk about that at another time. But tabernacles this morning is important to us. Because I want, I want you to understand it, I want to explain it, and I want to give you time to think about it and time to pray about it. Prophetically, we've already talked about this, that all seven of those feasts were, were dress rehearsals for something that was coming. The uh, Passover was a dress rehearsal for the cross. The unleavened bread, dress rehearsal for his death and his burial. The uh, first fruits were the dress rehearsal for the resurrection. Pentecost was the dress rehearsal for the giving of the Holy Spirit. They were given on the same day as those feasts. Not the day before, not the day after, on the exact day that those feasts occurred is when God's appointment occurred. There are three more to come. Rapture, Israel's salvation, and the wedding of Messiah. Those are the last three feasts, from trumpets to atonement to tabernacles. There's lots of other things that go on on those dates as well. They are a dress rehearsal ultimately for what we see up on the screen, the end game. But lots of other things happen on those dates as well, and they are equally as important. But if you don't have the right calendar, you'd never know. The date would pass you right by, and you'd never realize what happened. Tabernacles is what I want to talk about for this morning. And I want to emphasize and explain to you a little bit of what it's actually about. It's called Tabernacles. It's called, I, I think it, it's uh, one, one behind. There you go. It's called Tabernacles. It's also called the Feast of the Nations. It's also called the Feasts of Ingathering. And basically what Tabernacles is, is the Fall Feast. It happens in the fall. It is probably one of the biggest harvests. It's all of the fall fruits. And as a matter of fact, our Thanksgiving as Americans is a spin-off of tabernacles. The Puritans took the idea of tabernacles and they celebrated it with the Indians. And so today we have Thanksgiving as Americans, but believe it or not, it has its origins here in tabernacles. But God commanded his children in Leviticus chapter 23, you don't have to turn there, Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16, he explains to them, and explaining all seven of the feasts, that for the Feast of Tabernacles, he wants it to be a feast that lasts eight days. None of the other feasts last this long. This feast lasts eight days. And just like two of the other big feasts, God wants every male, every man that is above the age of accountability to be in Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now it wound up that not just every man came, but they brought many times their family and stuff. And as a matter of fact, every seven years, there was something called the Great Assembly, 
where everybody that was Jewish, man, woman, boy, and girl, had to come to Jerusalem. So on the three holidays when this happened, when everybody had to come, one was Passover, the other was Pentecost, and this, Tabernacles, where everybody had the responsibility of coming to Jerusalem. Now I want you to realize this Jerusalem during the year had approximately 60,000 or so people that lived in it. Jerusalem is a small city, about a two by two, two mile by two mile city. 60,000 people that normally live in it. But when the feast days came, when people came from all over the world that were Jews for the holidays, Jerusalem held over 250,000 people in it. It was crowded, is what I'm getting at. Lots and lots and lots of people, elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, all there for the feast. God commanded his children to come for this particular feast to commemorate a couple of different things. First of all, this feast actually starts when Moses brings the blueprints for the tabernacle down from the mountain. God instructs him that he wants him to build a tent where, where God's presence can dwell. And he gives him a specific set of blueprints and tells him to make this thing exactly like I showed you. So when he goes to the mountain, God shows him something. He gives him a glimpse of the throne room of God, the real throne room of God. And he tells them, now I want you to make a model of this in a smaller form when you get back down the mountain. And that's what he does. That's the first, that's the first time tabernacles are celebrated, or the first time it's initiated. One year later, it winds up that they've got the tent built. They've got all of the furniture built. Everything was done. They did it exactly a year to the day. And on the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day of the feast, is when Moses says, uh, it tells us that the fire of God came upon the actual tent. And the ruach, the wind, blew into the tent. And the tent opened up and breathed. And they knew that the presence of God was there. And the Shekinah glory filled the entire thing. So much so that nobody could even go into the tent to minister. That was the first real celebration of the day of tabernacles. What is God's overall desire for humanity? Anybody? To be with us. God's overall desire. Think about this. The creator of the universe wants to be with us. He wants to dwell with us. If you, you go right back to the book of Genesis, the relationship that Adam and the woman have with God, he wants to have with us. But that relationship was changed by disobedience. And, and for a while, there was just this break between God and man until he made a people called Israel and used everything about them to teach the rest of the world how God is going to bring everybody back to him. God's desire was, still is, and always will be to tabernacle with men. That's why when he told them to build the tent, what did they call it? Tabernacle. It means to dwell with. So when it says, I want to tabernacle with you, I want to dwell with you. And so God used this tent as a place that he could be in the midst of his people with all of Israel camped around him and taught them how to approach him and how to worship. That's what the first Feast of Tabernacles was all about. And then it winds up as time goes on that he begins to let them remind them of the days that they dwelt in the wilderness and they need to live in tents and all of that gets added to it. But understand the first and foremost reason for this holiday is because God wanted to dwell with us. He wants to be amongst his people. He wants us as normal, regular human beings to live out our days day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, year by year, yet have the presence of God right here with us. That's what he wants. It's what he has wanted. It's what, he, what, what he's wanted in the past, what he wants now, and what he will 
always want. He is the same. Revelation 21, verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. Has God's desire changed? No. What he wanted to do right in the beginning, he has always wanted to do, and everything he has ever done is to accomplish this thing. So that by the end of the book of Revelation, this can be said, that God is in the midst of his people as they live out their normal, everyday, real lives. Mm -hmm. Except there will be a people that are not normal. Not carnal. Not earthly. And not bound by death. But he will dwell in the midst of us. I know it's, a, it's an odd thing to even think about that when Mashiach comes, there will still be nations on this earth. There will still be, hopefully they'll still be in America. There'll still be a Great Britain, a Europe, and Asia. They'll still be here. The Bible tells us those nations that have come against God, he will wipe out and take off the face of the earth. But those that are left will live out their normal lives. Not so with those who are resurrected, though. It'll be different. But that's a, it's a, almost a crazy thing to think about, but that's what it says. God's desire has always been to live amongst us, to dwell or tabernacle. Keep that in the back of your mind. The Feast of Tabernacles, or its Hebrew name, is Sukkot. And we've done it here before we've built our Sukkot. It's, it's literally a tent. It's, in fact, it's not even really a tent. It's, it's kind of a thing with leaves all over it and, and an open-air top. And, and, you know, it's not the best kind of tent, but that's what God in, told them they needed to build and to live in for the week. So you picture 250,000 people making their way to Jerusalem. They fill up all of the places that you can live in, build sukkahs outside of them. The people that can't get into the places where they live, they begin building sukkahs all over the valley of, of, of Israel, between uh, Mount of Olives, between the Mount Zion, all the way to Bethlehem. There's nothing but sukkahs everywhere you look for miles. That's a quarter million people come for the festival. This is what God instructed his people to do. And you see up there in front of you is a picture of a, of a sukkah, and to the right of it are pictures of men holding the lulav, which are three different plants, and, and all three uh, mean something different. It's a palm branch, a myrtle branch, a willow, and something called an etrog. It's kind of like, like a lemon on steroids. It's a big, uh, it's a, it's a <laughs> It's a, it's a big uh, fruit. Uh, but, but all of these things, they all mean something about Messiah. I don't want to get into the detail of them all because I'll never finish the message and we'll talk about it another time. But all of this is part of the worship. They take it and they, they wave it in each direction, thanking God because he's the God of the north and the south and the east and the west. And, and they worship him. And this goes on for seven days. During this time of worship as they come to... Jerusalem. Most probably don't know this, but in the temple, there were candles on the outside of the temple, the area called the woman's court. And these candles were not like the menorah on the inside of the temple. These candlesticks were 75 feet high. Huge. Big. And what they would do is the priestly garments. Remember, they had to wear white when they went and, and did their service. They're wearing white as they're killing animals. And as you can imagine, blood inevitably is going to get on their clothing. And they would have to wash that clothing out. It would have to be white or they would not be allowed to serve inside of the temple. But when the clothes got so stained that you couldn't, you couldn't use it anymore, it wouldn't get white, they would take it and they would cut it into strips about yay wide, couple of feet long. And those strips, normally the priest family would take their own robes home, and then that priest would be fitted for a brand new robe so that when he serves, he has a white robe to come into the house of God with. Well, those strips that were cut were used on the day of tabernacles. They would get a young guy, a boy, because probably he's the only one that could do it, 
And you could see actually on the picture that's in front of you, I hope, hopefully you can see it, uh, they would get a ladder 75 feet high, and this young kid would climb up the ladder with a jar of flammable oil on his back and these strips of linen white cloth that have been stained red by lamb's blood and he would use the strips as wicks and tie them into the oil and then he would light it. Boy, who wanted that job? My kids complain when they got to go into the attic. 75 feet high, oil on your back and a match in your hand. But when they lit these candles, it was said by historians of that day that when all four candles were lit, you could see Jerusalem from anywhere in the Mediterranean. That's why later on, Jesus says, you are a city on a hill. Let your light shine. He's talking about tabernacles. And so Jerusalem was known as the city of lights. It was the place where God illuminated the world. From where? Mount Zion in Jerusalem. He is the light of the world. When Jesus says those words, I am the light of the world, guess what day it was when he said it? Tabernacles. They understood exactly what he meant. He was talking about that light. So all of this is part of the, uh, of the worship, but remember, this goes on for eight days. As a matter of fact, what it says is not only does this thing go on for eight days, but they are commanded to rejoice. Think about that. It's in Deuteronomy 16, I believe. They're told as a command. When you come to the Feast of Tabernacles, God's command is you better be happy. <laughs> now I know we all bump into people that are never happy, no matter what. But when the Feast of Tabernacles came around, guess what? You had to be happy. It's, it's hard for us to, I guess, wrap our mind around it, but think about this. This was a party that went on for seven days, all day, into the night, started all over the next morning. Singing and dancing and music and food and rejoicing. This was a party, literally. It was God's command that you re You couldn't come and just kind of, you know, all right, I'm going to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, you know. You had to rejoice. It was God's command that you smile. God's command that you be happy. God's command that you get up and you start dancing, doing that little Hebrew thing, you know. You had to. It was the command. Part of the worship, a part of the highlight was the water libation ceremony. And we've done that, at least mimicked it here, where the high priest would go down to the pool of Siloam with a silver goblet and fill it with water. And would, as a matter of fact, the place where he got the water from was called the rivers of living water. When Jesus says, out of your belly shall flow, what was he talking about? tabernacles and they would take a goblet full of oil and it would be poured out on the altar the water and the blood being poured out from his side on the altar remember everything's about Jesus everything's about Yeshua the water libation ceremony had another aspect to it you got to understand there were not just a small group of priests there were thousands and thousands of priests that served there were 24 different orders. And all of the priests had to serve during the festivals. They arranged the way that they served by week, starting in the beginning of the religious year. The first order served the first week. The second order served the second week. But when the feast came around, all hands on deck. Because during Passover, 250,000 lambs had to be slain. That takes a lot of people. 
And so it is, when tabernacles came around, all the priests came in to serve. And one of the ceremonies they would do is they would take hundreds of priests, would go out outside of the, uh, uh, outside of the gate called Beautiful to the valley of Moza and cut down willow branches. Now the willow branches were some 25 to 30 feet in length, huge branches. And they would uh, line up almost like an army, each holding these huge willow branches, some 25 men to a line, 50 to 100 men back to back. And they would mark, march back up to the beautiful gate. Meanwhile, there was another group of people who would go out doing the water libation ceremony and bringing that with the high priest up from the northern end. And it wound up that on one side they were walking up with the oil and the water and on the other side of the temple they were walking up with these huge palm leaves or, or willow leaves that they're waving back and forth creating a breeze. And it was a symbol of the water and the blood and the ruach wind of God coming into the temple. All of this was done during the Feast of Tabernacles. Every day was some amazing ceremony and people would gather all over the place to be part of it. They would walk around the altar all holding the lulavs, praying and singing out Psalms 113 to 118. All of them rejoicing. As a matter of fact, there was a, a an order of priests that would be lined up on the stairs, all playing flutes. They were called the pierced ones. And they would play music as they came up for the libation ceremony. Why are they called the pierced ones? Well, I guess you can figure that one out. Here's an artist rendering. While the priest danced and the music went on, you would have on the balconies all of the women and men and children would be standing there watching. This was huge. This was a thing that went on all day, all into the night, and then you did it the next day all over again. This was a party of parties, and it was a command that you be part of it. Could you be happy for eight days? I think we could swing it if we had to. The songs that they would sing... One of them came from Exodus chapter 15. It's the song that Miriam sings. And it says, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Every time you read the word salvation in your Bible, it is the word Yeshua. So what this song actually says is the Lord, God, is my strength, and my song, and he has become my Yeshua, Jesus. Isn't that a kicker? That's not the only place nor the only song that they sang. Psalms 118. Turn there with me if you would. Psalms 118. They would sing the voice, verse 15. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Why? They all have sukkahs all over the place surrounding Jerusalem. Skip on down if you would, verse 20. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my Yeshua. Verse 25, uh, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will and be glad. Why? It was a command that you must rejoice. These are the songs that they sang all throughout this week. Rejoicing. A party is what they wound up having. Okay, what does all of this mean to us and as far as Yeshua is concerned? On the eighth day of, of, the, of the feast, 
was the day called Rejoicing in the Torah. It was the day that the Torah was read and instruction was given to the people. Now every seven years, everybody had to come to Jerusalem and they would do the same thing, read the Torah from cover to cover to everybody. But during the Feast of Tabernacles, the rejoicing in the Torah on the eighth day was one of the biggest, one of the highlights. You got to hear God's word and be instructed in it. It's on that day, on the eighth day, while they are hearing the Torah, that they drag a woman out to Jesus. And they say, she's been taken in adultery. What do you say needs to be done with her? They were testing him in the Torah to try to catch him out there. And it winds up that you're testing the one who wrote, who is the Torah. And he winds up, as we know, writing on the ground. Jeremiah, I think, 31 says that the wicked shall have their names written in the earth. Those who forsake the Torah. So he's probably bending down, writing their names in the ground. The day that the Torah is being read, Jesus teaches them the Torah. Because the Torah doesn't say that the woman found in adultery should be brought before court. It says that the man and the woman found in adultery are to be brought before the judges. And you cannot stone anybody just because you found them guilty of adultery. You had due process, which was also part of the Torah. Most of us think that they just stone people. They didn't. You had, to go th you had to go through a long judicial system before it ever got to that point. And so, unfortunately, they abused it and changed it. But Jesus knew the Torah for what it really said and bent down and began to write their names in the ground. Why? They had forsaken the Torah. Then any, the most righteous of you throw the first stone, and they all begin to throw theirs. When does that happen? On the eighth day, which now makes that whole scene something different, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, it's on the seventh day, while they're doing the water libation, that Jesus stands up in the midst of everybody and yells out, I am the one who gives living water. And that didn't sit very well with all the priests. But was he right? Yes, because everything you're doing was about him. There's so much more I could share on tabernacles. They, they sacrificed not just animals on Israel's behalf, they sacrificed 70 bulls for the nations. Go back to Genesis, after the flood, it winds up that, that humanity, if you read Genesis, is broken up into 70 people groups. And it winds up that as God gives them tabernacles and instructs them on what to do, that part of what they did on tabernacles was not just to offer up offerings for themselves, but for the rest of the world as well. All nations. That's why it's called the Feast of Nations. And on that day, people brought all of their goods. Their, they brought lambs and bulls and bullocks, and they brought all their fruit and all the grains that they got and the grapes because it was the biggest harvest. It, on, during that week was payday for everybody. People that went to Jerusalem had money. They were coming for the feasts. What does all of this mean to us for Christmas? The true Christmas. It tells us in the Gospel of Luke that Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, served in the house of Abijah. Oh, that's the verse I wanted to share with you. It's Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the tabernacle of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Isn't that neat? Zechariah served under the order of Abijah. The order of Abijah was the eighth course. You wouldn't know this unless you went back and read it in the Torah. They were the eighth course of men to serve. So the first week, the first course served. They did the sacrifices. The second week, the second course served. The third week, 
You get the idea. Well, they started at the religious calendar, which is Nisan the first. Uh, and it would wind up that three weeks in would be what? Passover. So by the third week, the first two serve, but on the third week, all of the courses serve. Right? Everybody serves. Then, uh, I'm sorry, I, I said eighth. Uh, Abijah is the, is the third course. Then it would wind up that the fourth week would come and the people of the third course would serve then. And then the fourth week and the fifth week and the sixth week and so forth and so on. No, I'm sorry, it is the eighth course. I, I can't even read my own handwriting. So Abijah serves on the eighth course. It winds up that the eighth course is the week before Pentecost. So he would serve that week and then the next week's Pentecost, so what does he have to do? Serve all over again, and the lot falls on him to burn incense at the, at, at the uh, curtain. He's burning the incense at the curtain, and we know that it's Pentecost because in Luke chapter 1 and verses 10 and 11, it says the whole multitude of people were outside praying while he was inside burning incense. Why is the whole multitude there? It's Pentecost. 250,000 people are in Jerusalem. We know what week it is. It's then that the angel speaks to him and says, your wife will be with child. He doesn't believe it, and God makes him dumb, takes away his, his, his ability to speak. Ladies, wouldn't that be wonderful? Husband just shuts right up. In chapter 1 and verse 24, it's after his course is finished, or what we would say the end of June, that Elizabeth conceives. So we know when Elizabeth conceived, if you know what the courses are, you know it's Pentecost, you know she conceived afterward, which is June. Count five months because she hid herself. It says that she hid herself for five months. July, August, September, October, November. Then it says on the sixth month, she meets with who? Mary. Mary. She meets with Mary, which makes it now what? December. It is at that time that the angel meets with Mary. And Mary is overcome, and she is now with child. She meets her aunt, and the baby leaps within her at her sixth month, or Mary's first month. If that's December, you count nine months later, and it's the end of September, beginning of October. The Feast of Tabernacles. Do the math. You only hold the kid for nine months. It can't be December. Elephants do that, not human beings. <laughs> It's the end of September, beginning of October, or what on the Jewish calendar would be the seventh month. John 1.17 says, And the word, Torah, became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Do you know what he's saying? He's telling us when he was born. He came and tabernacled with us. He was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Think about that. If that's so, and there's 250,000 people in Jerusalem... When would Rome call a census to get taxes? When people had money. When did they have money? The feasts. Everybody came with all their grains and fruits and offerings. And you couldn't get into Jerusalem unless you paid taxes. Joseph and Mary get there, and there is no room at the inn. Why? It's elbow to elbow 
of people. 250,000 people jammed into Jerusalem, all the way to the outskirts outside of Bethlehem, nothing but tents everywhere. The only place there is for them to go, we call a stable. It's not just a stable, it's a sukkah. He's born under a sukkah. Oh my goodness. This is a God thing. Not only that, it tells us he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's the same word for the wicks that lit the candles. They are the priest garments stained with the lamb's blood. Oh, did you just hear what I said? Oh, I'm getting excited. I got chills. He is bearing the priest's clothing with the blood of lambs on him. On the Feast of Tabernacles. The day God ordained and commanded them to do what? Rejoice. Why? It's my kid's birthday. And my kids get in a party, whether you like it or not. And for a week, they danced and sang and jumped and ate and had a blast as a dress rehearsal. Born under a sukkah born the Lamb of God. We know a month later, because according to the Mosaic law, she has to wait until her cycle is complete. And then she can go to the temple and offer up the offering for the first son. And she offers up two turtle doves. But that's not what the law of Moses says. It says you offer up a... a a lamb, a yearling old. Or if you're poor, you can offer up two turtle doves. So a lamb was expensive, especially a yearling lamb. And so all she had to give for her son, all that she could give, all that Joseph could give, what father and mother don't want to give their kid the best that they've got? If they could have, they would have brought a lamb. They didn't realize they did they did bring a lamb of a yearling. And they brought the two turtle doves and, and the offering according to Moses was given. He was under the Mosaic law. But more, th and so they offer turtle doves which means they're poor. Who didn't get there yet? The Magi. Because they bring frankincense, gold, and myrrh. If they would have had that, Mary would have given the best lamb she could have gotten her hands on. So we know the Magi aren't even in the picture yet and probably won't get there for another six to eight months. Go back in the story and it tells us on the eighth day. How long does tabernacles last? Eighth day. On the day of rejoicing in the Torah, she brings young Jesus to be circumcised according to the law of Abraham, the covenant of Abraham. And he is named Jesus. When? On the eighth day. He's born on the first day of tabernacles, circumcised on the eighth day. According to the law, but according to the feasts. He was not born on December 25th. As a matter of fact, it is the sun god, Mithras, who was born on December 25th. And it was his birthday that Rome celebrated 
for hundreds of years, as well as the Saturnalia for hundreds of years. And they took the birth of Messiah and conveniently added it to the birth of the sun god. Go back to our text. You don't have to go in your mind. What does the Antichrist do? Changes laws and times. Why? Because if we know them, then we know more information. We know the appointments, and we're ready for them. Can we know when Christ was born for sure? Yes. It painstakingly, God goes out of his way again and again and again and again. Three times a year they had to come to Jerusalem. Passover, I want the world to see my son's death and resurrection. Pentecost, I want the world to see the Holy Spirit being poured out. Tabernacles, I want you there for my son's birthday. Not by accident, by design, because it is a holy convocation. Most of the church has no idea of this, because we are living by a different calendar. Three times in the Old Testament, the glory of God falls, or three times in the Bible. Once on Pentecost in Exodus, once in Second Chronicles on, on Tabernacles, and once on Pentecost. The same three holidays every man had to be in Jerusalem for. The birth of Christ comes, and shepherds are in the field in Bethlehem. He's born in Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. He's born in the house of bread. He is the bread of life. Bethlehem's also the place where all of the lambs ready for slaughter are born. And that's where he's born. The angels appear. And they do what? They rejoice. They do what God commanded Israel to do all those thousands of years before. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth towards men. They rejoice because the Lamb of God is born. There is still a tabernacles to come. As a matter of fact, everybody turn real quick to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah, just before Malachi, which is just, uh, just before Matthew. We read in Daniel about the end of Messiah coming and establishing a kingdom. And look at what it says in verse 12. It is the same thing that we read in Daniel. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem, who came against the Jews. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongue shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and on the mule, on the camel, the donkey, and on the cattle that will be in the camps. So shall this plague be as Messiah returns. Verse 16. And it will come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations after judgment which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. 
all nations that are still left on the earth year after year, just like all the men of Israel had to, will have to pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Why? To celebrate my son's birth and his wedding. They're the same day. If it's that big a deal, is it a big deal now? I'd say yeah. I'd say yeah. One more scripture, Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. And verse 1. The word of Isaiah, the son of Amuz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountain. It's talking about the coming of Messiah. He will establish his throne where? In Jerusalem. Afterward, I'm sorry, uh, shall establish on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Things are going to change when Messiah comes. But all men will have to go back to Jerusalem. When? Tabernacles. Tabernacles. God's given us a calendar of divine appointments. It's important that we learn what that calendar is. Because I'm sharing the end game with you. There are other things coming much sooner than that. Beloved, this is not religion. This is not go to church week after week. This is learn what life is. Learn what's really going on around us. Get ready for what is coming. Make sure your appointment calendar is set. Because we are on the verge of some amazing things. I believe that with all my heart. More feast days are coming. But for this morning, Christmas in September. More gifts. In all seriousness, it means a lot. I want you to pray over these things. I want you to think about these things. I don't want you to believe a word I told you. I want you to study it for yourself. I want you to let God speak to you. I don't want you to do anything because you feel that you being do it or whatever you do in obedience to God. It matters. It makes a difference. And that's God's word for you for this morning. God bless. Sing for